Hi, 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 Jakey Steve here, the long-haired freaky dude. Today I'm going to talk about Book 5 of the Histories of Herodotus, named Terpsichore, named after the Muse of Dancing. Man, I really, really love that name, Terpsichore. Why don't more people name their children Terpsichore? If I had a daughter, I would definitely push for the name Terpsichore. It's beautiful. This book digs deeper into the tensions betwixt the Greeks and the Persians, the Freemen and the Eunuchs, the Tunics and the Turbans. For the first time, Athens and Sparta and friends take the center stage of a book of the histories of Herodotus. Before we get started, there's another quote in here which I want to talk about, which just really reveals the great nature of Herodotus as a historian. How they came to be colonists of the Medes, I, for my part, cannot imagine. Still, nothing is impossible in the long lapse of ages. He finds something hard to believe, but he still gives it the benefit of the doubt, the credit of possibility, because indeed, strange, unpredictable things can happen to the long hand of time. So, the first thing that happens is the Persians attack under the control of Megabesus, the backwards Thracians, who probably had square wheels and ate with their butts. I mean, really, just, just listen to some of their customs here, okay? To be idle is accounted the most honorable thing, and to be a tiller of the ground the most dishonorable. A world where the lazy are more praised than the working class? How does any work get done if the working class aren't praised? If, ever, if everyone's just sitting around being idle and sleeping and dying, dying of idleness. Then again, I suppose that's not too absurd of a concept. It's how every monarchy works. Everyone praises the lazy slob of a king who doesn't do anything. Meanwhile, uh, they turn their noses at the hard-working peasant who, you know, no one respects. The Thracians also weep at the birth of a child and celebrate when a person dies. Now, I, I can sort of understand where they're coming at from this, you know. They're weeping because uh, their, their child entered into this evil, sinful world, and they're celebrating because he has left it and hopefully gone on to a better place. But it's still, nonetheless, backwards from other customs. You, you know, typically, typically, typically here, I'm not saying all the time, I'm saying most of the time, okay? Most of the time, we prefer living friends to dead ones, okay? You, you, dead friends can't play Dungeons and Dragons with you on Sundays, okay? Uh, that aside, in the Thracian area, there were some interesting stories. As always, as tends to be the trend with uh, Herodotus' narratives, uh, uh, along their northern area, along the Ister, a.k.a. the Danube River, it's very lush, very fertile, but it's completely uninhabited by people, solely because of the large population of mosquitoes which dwell there. And here I thought that was only a problem that Africa and Arkansas had to deal with. And there's just this, this really swell guy who came from the city called Peonia. And uh, he really wanted control of the city of Peonia. So he went to the Persians and asked them to go to war with Peonia. And the Persians did go to war, so the Peonians, you know, they got all ready, got all prepared for war. All the good fighting people, they left the city and went to the battlefield so that they could go fight and save their homeland. Meanwhile, this, this really swell guy, he showed the Persians a back route around the city and led them right through the back door while there was no troops in the city at all because they were all at the battlefield expecting battle. Persians made it right in without a fight. Oh man, what a swell guy. There was also this tribe of people in the Peloponnesian area who built platforms with huts on top that floated on lakes. And in the middle of this hut platform home, there was a hole through which they could fish while they were inside of their home. Life on the water. It's a really cool concept and it's not too dissimilar from the really neat floating homes that you see in modern-day Amsterdam. Uh, but what I thought was really surprising is that I remember reading somewhere, maybe watching a documentary, a culture almost identical to this who lived all the way over in Eastern Asia, so I think it's interesting that they have very similar ways of living, and they're so far apart. I also thought it interesting that it makes mention of an Alexander from Macedonia hundreds of years before the Alexander of Macedonia, Alexander the Great, which we know of. But name aside, this guy, he was really clever, really cool too. 
So these Persian ambassadors, these sort of Persian spies, were in the city of Macedonia. And whenever Persians are in your Greek city, that's not a good thing, okay? They likely want to take you over. They likely want to gain control of your city. Alexander doesn't like this being the king, so he comes up with a plan. He has his men disguise themselves as women, and then they lust, they pretend to lust for the Persian ambassadors. And whenever the Persian ambassadors got to the, the, the right level of horny, the men would then uh, pull out their daggers and stab the Persians and kill them. And surprisingly, thanks to the bribes of real women, this, uh, this masterful plan was never revealed to the Persians. They never knew that it happened. It was kept a secret. So Alexander was able to keep his city of Macedonia while all around him was turning into Persian territory. After all that jazz, a guy named Autanes, who once was the champion for democracy in Persia, the guy who tried to make Persia a democracy, is now the head of the monarchical army. Uh, you know, whatever, whatever floats your boat, Autanes, you philosophical traitor. But anyways, this guy, he's got a really wicked throne, it turns out. Very heavy metal, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Cambyses skew and flayed Sisimimes, Autanes' father, and cutting his skin into strips, stretched them across the seat of the throne. And Autanes kept it this way. Autanes kept a throne, a chair, made out of his father's stretched skin. Okay, now, I gotta admit, that's kind of pretty gnarly, man. I think that would make the Scythians proud. I mean, uh, the thing is that Artane still sits on the throne, you know? Uh, Artane's who occupied so strange a throne. Yeah, strange all right, strange sitting on your dead father, eh? And, uh, you know, I wonder how well that chair uh, conformed to the contours of his butt, you know? Was it a stretchy chair or was it a firm chair? These are the questions that we have to ask whenever pondering history. Anyways, Autanes decides to focus his armies on places like Byzantium and islands off of Asia Minor. Then there's this one guy, uh, you know, just a really big old general turd nugget named Hestius, whose selfishness and arrogance just causes a lot of mayhem. He came from the Asia Minor city of Miletus, but was captured by Darius and sent to Susa all the way over in the Middle East, you know, far away from home. Uh, so this guy, wanting to get back home, thinks that if he could start riots and upheavals against the Persians in Miletus, then the Persian king Darius will send him back to Miletus so that he can sort things out. So he contacts the guy in control of Miletus, Aristagoras, and tells him to start a revolt in his hometown, the place he wants to return to. Now, you know, of course he must send this message in secret so that no one knows what he's doing. So what he does is he carves the message, he carves the message into the scalp of a slave, of a bald slave, and then he lets the hair grow out, cover up the message, then he sends the slave off to Aristagoras. I think that's actually a really brilliant way to, to carry a concealed message. I've never thought of doing something like that. I, I think it could probably work even today like with something like a tattoo. Uh, so if you want to get something by without anyone noticing, just carve it into your head, man. You, that's all you got to do. So Aristagoras will start a revolt, but first he won't get by without a little help from his friends. So he goes off to Sparta, Lacedaemonian, and uh, Attica, Athens, and he asks for help from those guys. Uh, and it gives a little backstory of each of these places here, which I'll talk about just a little bit later. Uh, but Sparta says no, Athens says yes. And they go, uh, Athens goes to help with the revolt, to which Aristagoras claims, It seems indeed to be easier to deceive the multitude than one man. The revolt ultimately succeeds in burning down the, the major city of Sardis in Lydia, but uh, Aristagoras, being his cowardly self, backs him and his, his army down, leaving the Greeks and the Athens all to themselves to be slaughtered by the Persians. What a swell guy. <laughs> now for the fun stuff, Sparta in Athens stuff. The 300 are so close I can almost taste them. It's really exciting. And I mean, the Spartan story, it starts off with the birth of Leonidas. And I'm just like, oh boy, some Persian booty about to get whooped now. Leonidas has been born. Yeah! <sighs> but anyways, right now he isn't important to the story. Who is important is his brother from another mother, but not from another father. Cleomenes is the important one, the guy who refused to help Aristagoras. We beseech you, therefore, by the common gods of the Grecians, deliver the Ionians, who are your own kinsmen, from slavery. So spake Aristagoras. 
It doesn't win over the Spartans' hearts, but I like it because it's a pretty revealing thing about the nature of the Greeks. They aren't like the Persians, who are one collective empire ruled by one man. The Greeks, they aren't ruled by one man. Rather, they're, they're a collection of city-states who all have different forms of rule, different ideas, and can all make different decisions independent of themselves. They don't look up to one thing, one entity. So what is it what, which binds all of these city-states? What, what is it that makes all of these city-states look at themselves and call themselves Greek if they don't have a common rule? It, what is it that binds them? What is it that makes them Greek? Aristagoras points out it's the gods. They all worship the same gods. That is the common link. That is the thing which is similar across all of the Greek city-states. That is what makes a Greek a Greek. Not nationality, but gods. It is worship which unites the Greeks, not rule or relig uh, rule or, or government. Uh, and that, that's really why these gods are so important throughout Greek literature, because it is the thing that unites them. It's the thing that makes them all common, all Greek. Meanwhile, Athens is currently being corrupted by a horrible tyrant named Hippias. And you know, back then, Sparta was actually kind of a democracy and Athens was a tyranny. Anyways, Hippias banishes some people from Athens, and it just so happens that these people are the people who go on to build the Oracle of Delphi, one of the most glorious temples in all of Greece. And, you know, they're kind of angry about being kicked out of Athens, and they, they, they went back in. So they bribed the Pythonists to give an oracle to the Spartans, to the Lacedaemonians, to sack Athens and dethrone its leader, Hippias. The Spartans do so thinking that it is a commandment of the gods. And this is really the first time in Greek literature where I've heard something outright reveal a scandal behind the oracles. Uh, you know, uh, revealing it as something that isn't true, isn't divine. Uh, so the Spartans do this, they abide by the scandalous oracle, they dethrone Hippias, and Athens becomes a free, uh, a free city-state, a democracy. Um, but the Spartans eventually discover what the, the Athenians did to take back control of their city. They grow very angry at them, and Sparta isn't the only one angry at Athens. There's a lot of people angry at Athens, also angry at them, are the Thebians. Now, I, I presume some of these tensions which are building right now within Greece roll over the Greco-Persian War and are the cause, or are the fuel behind the fire of the Peloponnesian War. Uh, and you know, there's always someone angry with how things were. There was an angry Athenian. So he went to Sparta and asked them to sack Athens again. And Sparta is more than happy to comply this time because they tricked him into sacking it the first time. So Athens sends a, a messenger to Persia asking them for help so that they can, in return, sack Sparta and Lacedaemonia. And, uh, and the messenger, the little fool that he is, he agrees to the Persians one one and only term, and that is that if they are to help Athens fight Lacedaemonian, that all of Athens is to become the property of Persia, and that they are to bow down to Persia, and that they are to respond to Persian rule. The citizens of Athens don't like this. They enjoy their freedom way too much. The Spartans were still mad about what the oracles did to them, so they sought out Hippias, whom they booted from Athens, and wanted to reinstate him as controller of the city, but thankfully there was a council held, and thankfully to a Corinthian named Sosilus, this did not happen. Uh, and because of this right here, the Spartans finally decided to let Athens be. There is nothing in the world so unjust, nothing so bloody as tyranny, and reinstating Hippias would only bring blood, tyranny, and unjustness. He goes on to tell a story about how oligarchy and tyranny reigned his city for a long time, and the evils and the woes and the blood and the pain that it caused. And after hearing this, Sparta backs off from Athens. Persia, on the other hand, does not forgive them, seeing the, the foolhardy agreement that the messenger made. Now Hippias, he goes to Persia now to ask to be reinstated in Athens. The Persians tell the Athenians that they must reinstate Hippias as the leader of their city, or otherwise be conquered and perish at the hands of the Persians. Uh, the freedom-loving Athenians, they just do not like these tyronious terms. And for the first time, for the very first time, we see everyone vote. We see all of the Athenians vote to outright deny the wishes of the Persians and be at open enmity with them. 
And this is the first time that the Athenians openly declare war on the Persians. This is the first time that we have set sides where we can clearly see who will be fighting who. The freedom, democracy loving Grecians versus the slavery, monarchy loving Persians. And it's clear that the outcome of this will indeed determine the lasting fate of the other side. And I'll end this with a really fantastic quote from Herodotus concerning freedom and democracy. And it is plain enough, not from this instance only, but from many elsewhere like, that freedom is an excellent thing. And freedom is indeed an excellent thing. Well, I'm Jakey Steve, the long-haired freaky dude. Thank you for watching this book review. If you want to see more great book reviews, please check out my channel and hit the subscribe button. You might also like checking out the Great Books Challenge, where there's many great books for you to read. It really is an incredible experience. And I will be going off to college soon. It's going to cost a lot of money. So if you have the time, if you have the, the chance to spare a dollar or two, I ask you to go check out my GoFundMe page and just make a small contribution to help me go to the college I want, which will actually be uh, giving me a classical education in these great books. Well, I'm Jakey Steve. Thank you for watching this. Be sure to have a great day. See you all later.